science in sport we have got 20 minutes with none other than sir chris hoy you can see right next to me now uh, you've been coming in with your droves with your questions over the last uh, few hours uh, we've had a few technical difficulties which means we're back to our original scheduled time of 2:45 in the uk rather than 2:30. Uh, but we will get straight on with it first up from Browning, my question for Sir Chris is, do you have a favourite velodrome and which is it? Hopefully no one has asked this yet. Um, thank you, Bronwyn. Um, favourite velodrome, I'd have to say Manchester. Um, I spent so many years there training, so many great memories from races, World Championships, Commonwealth Games, World Cups, National Championships, amazing. Um, in terms of tracks themselves, Moscow, probably my favourite track. It's huge. It's 333 metres, but it's got huge big bankings. Real breathtaking place to go and just see, let alone ride. Um, or maybe La Paz in Bolivia. That was where I broke the world record for the 500 metre time trial. It's the highest velodrome in the world. It's on top of this amazing mountain range. As far as views are concerned, that is the, the best velodrome I've ever seen. Uh, I'm going to let you hold on to the microphone. Your qu answers hopefully are going to be longer than the questions. Uh, next one comes in from Jordan. Uh, if you could be any other rider, or could have been any other rider apart from yourself, uh, who would you have been and why? That's a tough question. I would say somebody who's had a huge impact on the sport and who, um, whose memory sort of lasts on longer than just their results. And for s I think the person who was a hero to me growing up and the person who I think fits that bill would be Graham O'Brien. Um, you know, you think about what he did for cycling, the fact that for so many decades, hundreds of years, people have been riding the same way. And uh, he came up with a brand new riding position that was more efficient and much faster, broke the world record, became world champion. The, you know, the, uh, the federation, the, uh, the governing bodies banned it, changed the position again, came up with an entirely new position. Just incredible, a, a genius. Um, and his story and the way he approached his training, his competition, um, inspirational guy and so for me uh, to be anybody it would have been Graham Aubrey. Uh Okay uh, we will ask the third question very shortly just to remind you that you can pose your questions if you're watching via Facebook just below this video. Uh, we have got loads sent in already but I will be trying to keep my eye on my phone at those questions as well so I'm not actually being rude I'm keeping an eye <laughs> on what the public is asking. Uh, Renata Raffo his son wants to know does Fergus find his dad uh, he, says he loves your books very well written thank you for those of you who don't know Chris has just written some children's books about a cyclist called Fergus thank you yeah thanks for the question about flying Fergus um, I don't want to spoil the story but um, Fergus's dad essentially for those of you who don't know who haven't read any of flying Fergus and I'm sure there's quite a lot of you that haven't um, he lives with his mum and his grandpa above his grandpa's junk shop and he's mad about cycling and um, yeah he's never actually met his dad so his grandpa's told him he lives in a place called Nevermore and his mum said he lives in, D in Kilmarnock um, and part of the story is about him travelling to this place called Nevermore and he's, he's searching for his dad but I don't want to give too much away but his dad does play a central role in the stories as, uh, as the books progress. There's five books out, we're writing five more so there's plenty of time to see what happens. Thank you. Uh, a nutrition based question now which comes in from Richard Kitching. Uh, what was your pre-competition ride meal and were supplements included within that? Well, it, it depended on what time of day um, the racing was taking place. It depended if it was one race, like the kilo, a one-off effort, or if it was a series of races like the sprint um, or the Kieran, where you're racing potentially from maybe 9 o'clock in the morning through till 9 or 10 at night. So very different challenges. Um, the key thing is, if it's a one-off race, if it's a one big effort, <coughs> excuse me, you want to make sure you've digested the food, you've had enough time for the, the body to assimilate all the nutrients from it. Um, something light and easy to digest, something with um, carbohydrates for energy. If it's very high intensity workout, you need carbohydrates. Something with a, you know, a balance of protein as well in there too. Um, something simple, whatever you, whatever you need. I think the key thing is not to have too much simple sugars. Um, if you have simple sugars, you get this instant response, instance of... Um, um, glucose response in the bloodstream, um, so you want a sustained release. And supplements were part of that. I wanted to make sure I had enough of all the micronutrients, um, making sure there was protein, make sure there was the right kind of carbohydrates in there. And of course, this is a science and sport um, su supported uh, event we're doing here, and science and sport have been suppliers for my nutrition for well, pretty much my whole career, um, ever since 1994. I remember getting my first ever creatine monohydrate. KR10, I think it was back in the day. So um, yeah, it it depended on what event and what I would have. But um, I would say that the key thing is to make sure you try in training your your nutrition plan before you get to race day. Never try anything new 
that's the biggest rookie error you can do is to do something completely different on race day you never normally do and that's a recipe for disaster Good advice indeed. Uh, I should also say actually that uh, we are at the Lee Valley Velodrome which holds a place uh, dear in Chris's heart no doubt. This is where he took his sixth and final gold medal as an Olympian before he retired. Uh, we've got a question that has come in underneath our live Facebook video. Uh, it's quite a common question actually having looked at the ones over the previous few hours from Benjamin Allen. Do you ever struggle to find trousers, jeans, stroke casual shorts that fit? I'm guessing the answer is yes. And where do you find the more athletic cut garments? Basically saying that I'm not athletic because I've got slightly skinnier legs. <laughs> um, yeah, I do struggle. I think all sprinters, a lot of play, guys who play rugby or other sports where you're, you're going to be building muscle in your legs, um, to get jeans that fit at the waist but also fit your legs isn't easy. I tend to go for brands that have a bit of stretch in the garment. Um, but because I struggle to find them, do you know what, I'm actually, I am in the process of making my own jeans. This, this, isn't, a, <laughs> this isn't actually a, a, you know, a planted question. I am seriously thinking about trying to make them. I've got my own range of cycling clothing and we're looking to include jeans in that overall um, s you know, strategy, that plan. So um, yeah, it's just it's just very difficult. Otherwise, you can get jeans to fit, but they have massive big waists or, or you know, you get the waist to fit, but the, the legs are too tight. Uh, well, if you're looking for a model for your new range, you've got my number. <laughs> uh, my wife's actually asked a question. If Chris Hoy could invent a track event, what would it be? Well, that's a good one. Well, I'll tell you what I'd like to see back in the Olympics. That's not the question. I will answer it. But the, the Kilo um, is an event I used to do, I think. It's a great event for um, for the general fans, for the general public who maybe don't follow cycling all that often. It's a very simple event. It's a great test of, you know, mental tackle challenge too. It's a really painful event. And I think it's a great one to watch. And it's a shame it's out at the Olympics. But if I could invent one, being a sprinter, I, um, what would what be quite nice is to see a race that's maybe halfway between endurance and sprint. So maybe something like a, a standing six lap um, time trial. So you would get guys who were very good kilo riders or sprinters yeah. who could just about hang on for six laps. But guys like Bradley Wiggins, Garrett Thomas, who were great pursuiters. But yeah, Ed Clancy, I think Ed would be perfect for that one. But a standing six lap or a, fifth, you know, a, a one and a half kilo race from a standing start time trial, that would be a, a good crowd pleaser, I think. Uh, next question. It came in for, I've forgotten who uh, said it, but you reminded me with the kilo just there. Uh, somebody asked, what was the peak power that you ever registered? And my own personal question is, what kind of average would you have done for around about one minute for the kilometre? Peak power, um, highest ever peak power is about two, 250, sorry, 2,580, um, 19, almost 2,600 watts. You only sustain that for a matter of a second, two seconds. It's a real spike of power. Um, but it's all about that explosive power. That's the difference between a track sprinter. A road sprinter like Mark Cavendish might put out 16, 1700 watts of power, but they're much smaller and they're doing their sprint at the end of a six hour race. So, you know, v pure sprinters, track sprinters can produce 2500, 2600 watts. Um, for a kilometre, for an average of a minute, um, 1100 watts, nearly 1200 watts for an average for a minute. Um, but again, that's, that's not an even 1100 watts flat. It's you hit over 2000 watts and then the power comes down and down and down. And by the last 100 metres, you're lucky if you're actually leaning on the pedals at all. It's, it's, it's absolutely horrendous. Um, just this lactic acid building up in your legs. Everything starts to shut down and you can barely turn the pedals. 1,200 watts for a minute. Uh, that was something I was very pleased to get for one second not so long <laughs> ago. Uh, another common question, uh, which I'm trying to find again. Oh yeah, Gerard McHugh uh, is amongst many who've asked this one. Why do track riders sprint while sitting down and road riders sprint while standing up? Yeah, that's a good question. Essentially, it's to do with a lot to do with cadence and how much quicker track cyclists pedal when they're sprinting. So the higher the cadence, the more efficient it is to sit down, and also they're producing a lot more power. Um, road riders tend to do it. You know, it, it's bigger gears out the saddle, use their weight, and the peak powers wouldn't be quite as high. But it's um, I think you, you will see the odd sprint. Maybe it's a downhill sprint, a fast sprint. Riders like Greipel um, or other riders, Kittel potentially, might actually stay in the saddle and, and pedal in the saddle because it is more efficient if you're going faster. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel Johnson, underneath the live Facebook video, has asked, how did you fund your early days of cycling? Because it's not a cheap sport to continue and maintain, really, is it? It's not, but at the same time, I think you can put a cap on, on the, the equipment. You don't have to spend a huge amount on equipment. I think you can get 95% of the way there to a really solid, decent bike without buying the latest things and, and, you know, and spending. You can almost spend anything you want on, on equipment. For me, the biggest thing was, the biggest costs were traveling to races. That my, and it was my parents. My parents basically funded 
you know, we'd stay in the cheapest bed and breakfast. We'd had a knackered old diesel Citroen um, BX, which had done nearly 200,000 miles. Um, you know, it was done on a budget and the time was spent, uh, the money was spent on getting to races or getting to training and making the most from that experience, not getting the best bike at the time because particularly when you're younger and you're growing, um, you know, it, it's about learning t the tactics, the techniques um, and working hard. And it's, yeah, I think too much emphasis can be on getting the latest bit of carbon, which doesn't always help you. It might give you a fraction of a second, but you can improve much more by, you know, experience of racing and, and, and watching the best guys in the world and, and racing and training with them. Uh, how times have changed. Uh, Chris has since graduated from a Citroen BX to a Citroen ZX, which is a long way <laughs> up the alphabet. Um, <laughs> Peter Billick asks, are Dan's legs as big as Chris's arms? Well, we are about to tell you because we're going to do some measurements. So bear in mind, there'll be a bit of silence for a few seconds. And I do calves. <laughs> 13 inches. There we go. <laughs> Can I get the flex? There we go. 16 inches. There we go. If you didn't hear that, that's 13 inches around my calf versus 16 inches for Sir Chris Hoy's bicep. So the answer to your question is no, my legs are not as big as Sir Chris Hoy's arms. Uh, Rebecca Howard, how much involvement do you have with the development of young, particularly track riders, if any? Uh, and if so, how much fun is that? Yeah, I do. Well, we, we, through the, um, the Revolution series, we sponsor the, the Future Stars event and with the Hoy brand. I've got my own range of bikes and through that we sponsor that. And therefore, through that, you get a fair bit of contact with the younger riders. It's amazing how many have come through that race series and got on to become world Olympic champions. You know, the, the previous, you know, last 10 years, you look at some of the names and it's pretty much the, the, the GB team in there, the current GB team in there. Um, just on, on an ongoing basis, you know, I'll be at various velodromes around the country and I'll be chatting to the younger riders. Nothing, you know, no formal roles to actually uh, to be involved in, but I have been... Still in touch with some of the younger GB riders, guys like Philip Hines, even, you know, who, who did the, the first lap for the team sprint in London. Double Olympic champion now, won another gold medal with the team sprint in Rio. And it's just it's just enjoyable to keep in touch with them and, and to to be, a, you know, a friendly ear to listen to some of their problems if they're frustrated with training or form or whatever um, and try and give them some sort of neutral advice. Thank you very much again. Um, we have around seven minutes left in this Facebook Live. Chris is almost a busier man since he's retired from cycling than he was uh, when he was racing. Uh, but we've got another question that has been asked multiple times. I'm going to read this one out from Lewis McColl. Uh, people seem to be very interested in how much time you spent in the gym versus actually on the bike as a track sprinter. Yeah, as a track sprinter, well, first of all, I think it's easier to maintain strength than it is to build it. So in the early years of my career, I was doing a lot more in the gym to gain the strength. And then once you have the strength, um, you can maintain it without spending quite as much time. By the end of my career, I was only doing two, s two gym sessions per week. Very, very high intensity, very explosive, really full on, but only two sessions a week. Um, and I would say for, uh, for a sprinter, for a track sprinter, it's essential, particularly these days, the gears are getting much bigger that they're using on the track. So I used to race on maybe a 52-14, 53-14 sometimes, and they're now using upwards of 60-odd, 65 tooth chaining on the front with uh, a 13 or even a 12 on the back, ridiculously big gears. And with that, you need to have extra force production. It's all about torque. It's all about force, not so much about power and cadence. So um, they have to adapt the training and do more gym for that. Whether you're, if you're an endurance cyclist, you know, the question is, should I do gym work in the winter? Should I do more strength work? Th the big answer is, well, y yes and no. You don't need a huge amount of strength to turn a gear and pedal at maybe 500 watts. Almost anybody can do that. It's about how long you can do that for. So it's about being efficient. Um, but having a little bit of extra power, a little bit of extra, you know, um, strength, have a quick short burst up a short steep climb, or accelerate or bridge a gap in a race or sprint at the end, you know, it can always be handy. Uh, Benjamin Chu wrote in saying, hey Chris, as far as most cyclists go, your body looks pretty balanced in terms of its distribution of muscle bulk. Actually, that's probably something that you and I have quite in common. Mine's fairly <laughs> evenly distributed as well. Uh, what's the best way to not end up looking like a T-Rex? Huge legs and no arms. Well, I would say, first of all, you know, we didn't train to try and look a certain way. You don't, you don't train to get even big legs. You train to get stronger or faster for your sport. So you train very specifically for your sport. And your body adapts to the training that you're doing. So you don't, you know, you don't look at a sportsman and think, I want to look like them and, or train like them to be that shape or size. You train or you should be training to be the best you can be in your sport. 
But if you're doing it purely for aesthetics, then it's just about using the various parts of your, your body that you to get um, symmetry or you know an even even balance. But the reason you see guys with small arms is because they want to be as aerodynamic as possible. And I didn't train my arms. I didn't train to have big arms or a big upper body. But when you're doing standing starts on the bike and you're bracing and you're pulling very hard on the handlebars, you're obviously using your muscles in a very, very explosive way. So you do get muscle gains from, uh, from, from riding your bike. And I hope you can hear me over the noise in the background because there's a bit of a racket going on. But, um, but yeah, I would say if you're training for your sport, don't worry about what you look like. Worry about your performances. And if your performances are good, then you're training right. Uh, yeah, not entirely sure what the noise is, but uh, we shall speak slightly louder. Uh, the next question comes from Paul Lefebvre, a uh, question for Sir Chris. How influential was Steve Peters' chimp paradox model on you winning and what aspect of his model helped you the most? For those of you who don't know, uh, he was the Team GB psychologist, sports psycho psychologist that helped many of the GB Olympians over the last decade or so. Yeah, Steve was influential in, I would say, most of the team, not just the cyclists and the, the athletes, but the, the support staff, making sure that the team um, interacted well and, and operated well as a unit. Um, for me personally, I think his, his ability to help me get perspective and deal with pressure and, and focus on the moment and not build things up too much inside my head and get too stressed about the racing, because it's quite easy when you come to you know, the Olympic Games, you've been training for it for four years or sometimes for your whole career for that one moment. Um, and it can it can become almost, you know, too big in your head in terms of the, the scale of the, the challenge ahead. So it was about just dealing with each day one step at a time um, and just realizing that, you know, if you focus too much on the outcome, if you focus too much on that gold medal or you focus too much on the consequences of winning or losing, then it can really distract you. So focus on the process of what you need to do to be the best you can be and if you do that, you know you're going to be there or thereabouts. And, you know, sometimes things are out with your control. You don't always win. But if you've done your best, that's all you can ask for. Yeah, you definitely need a strong mind as well as strong legs and heart if you want to be a top pro cyclist, as Chris was. Uh, I think probably we only have time for two more questions because Chris has given nice, long, detailed <laughs> answers. Uh, so the next one I would like to ask comes in from Claire Sawyer. Uh, any hints for a six-year-old who wants to grow up to be Jason Kenny? Sorry. Oh. Uh, yeah. Didn't read that all the way through before <laughs> I asked it, but nevertheless, I shall continue with the question. Uh, sorry, he oh, okay, in brackets, sorry, he's too young to remember 2012, so there is an excuse there. Um, yeah, I'll let him off, go on then. Um, as long as he reads Spying Fergus. Yeah, the, um, any hints on a six-year-old who wants to, well, I would say, first of all, enjoy it. Just, you know, don't, uh, as a parent, I would say the advice is don't put too much pressure on your children. You know, encourage them, support them to do what they want to do in sport, but don't put pressure on them because as soon as they're old enough to make their own choices, they'll, they'll stop racing or stop competing. Um, make it fun, give them the opportunities, and uh, focus on, I would say, on the techniques and the tactics and the, the, the technical side of things, the skills, rather than just working really hard. Because if you try and push kids too much and, and make them the physical side too important, they'll, they'll stop enjoying it and uh, it won't be fun anymore. But that's for me, I race BMXs from the age of seven till I was 14. I did it because I loved it. I loved the competition, I loved the fun, um, but I was also very competitive and I wanted to do the best I could in the races. So um, yeah, just support them, give them the chances and let them lead the way. Very good advice indeed. Okay, the final question is gonna allow me to allow Chris to blow his own trumpet slightly because he's a very <laughs> modest man indeed, despite his achievements. Um, from Ali Sir Codling, uh, what is Chris's, oh no, it's wrong, wrong question, sorry, George Hunter. Apologies, Alice Codling. I'm not going to ask you a question. Uh, what was your favourite win throughout your career? My favourite win throughout my career, until we came to the Olympics in 2012, hands down, I would have said my first gold medal at the Olympics in Athens, 2004. An amazing night. It was the 1,000 metre time trial against the clock, one by one, reverse order. I was last to go. The times got quicker and quicker and quicker. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm not getting emotional. I'm just got to sort of... And, uh, and it was... It was like the perfect script and I won my first Olympic gold medal and you know to be n when you hear your name for the first time followed by Olympic champion as you step on the podium there's no feeling as good as that until you do it in front of your home crowd as your last Olympic gold medal sixth Olympic gold medal here um, thought I'd seen and done it all before I didn't think it was going to be quite as special as it was but I was in floods of tears I was a right a right mess you know I didn't even get on the podium before the tears started to well up because I could see all my family in the crowd, my friends. It was the last race 
of the Olympic Games, the whole program. So all the teams had gathered in front of the podium. So you could pick out all these folk, all these faces, and knowing it was the last time I was ever going to do it as well as my last Olympics, that was just unbelievable. And what a great way to, to sort of finish my career. I think there are a lot of goosebumps in the world on that sixth and final gold medal for Chris, probably for himself as well. Uh, right, we shall draw things to a close for our Facebook Live. It only uh, leaves me to thank Chris very much indeed for the time that he's allocated for us today. Uh, if you didn't get your question asked, there is a small chance that we asked it before we came live because we didn't ask GC anything. And Chris is also, in the not too distant future, going to give us some nutritional tips on the channel as well. So we shall wrap it up there. Chris, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Cheers.